up on this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon. The South Korean government says it's ready to counter any provocations by North Korea after it fired what are believed to be short, four short-range Scud missiles into the East Sea. The Korean government has taken steps to control the country's ballooning household debt, promising more fixed-rate loans and a 5 percentage point cut in the debt-to-income ratio over the next three years. Plus, Washington urges Moscow to refrain from interfering in the crisis hit Ukraine as ousted Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych appears in Russia after spending a week in hiding. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. For joining us, you're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Chi Yuzan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with the latest development out of North Korea. Inter-Korean relations seem to be going on the right track. Uh, but on Thursday evening, uh, Korea time, Pyongyang launched four short-range Scud missiles into the East Sea. And for the latest on the launches, we turn to our Kim Hyun Bin, who is joining us in the studio. Hello, Hyun Bin. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, the South Korea uh, Defense Ministry said about an hour ago that the North fired four projectiles, and considering their speed and direction, uh, is presumed uh, to be uh, short-range Scud missiles. Uh, this is the North's first Scud missile launch in five years. The ministry said the launch seems to have been planned to coincide with the start of Seoul's annual military drills with Washington. It follows an incursion by a patrol boat over the de facto maritime border between the two countries on Monday, which the Seoul's defense ministry said at the time was set, uh, was sent uh, to test the South Korean military. The ministry said the South Korean military is prepared for any provocations from the north. Uh, just hours before the launch, Seoul had proposed a round of Red Cross talks to resolve humanitarian issues, including reunions for families separated by the Korean War. Uh, the talks are expected to be held as early as next week. On top of that, a private organization had recently offered to send supplies and food aid to the north, worth nearly, nearly uh, 180,000 U.S. dollars. So, Hyunmin, what might be some of the reasons for the launch? Uh, well, there are some conflicting views. Uh, with the recent improvement of inter-Korean relations, uh, some experts believe the North executed the launch to get leverage during negotiations between the two Koreas. Other experts believe that this was a protest against the strong condemnation of the North's nuclear program and humanitarian, uh, human rights violations by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, Korean broadcaster YTN reported, citing government officials, that North Korea also fired off four projectiles from its eastern coast, north of Wonsan, into the East Sea in a northeasterly direction last Friday, during the second day of the inter-Korean family reunions. The projectiles were believed to have a range of around 100 kilometers. And the Korean government is keeping a close eye uh, on the recent provocations and plans to uh, set out countermeasures for, against future provocations. Okay, uh, Hyun Bin, thank you very much for your report there. That was our Kim Hyun Bin reporting on North Korea's latest Scud missile launch. North Korea and Japan have agreed to meet for a working level Red Cross talks in China next week. This according to Japan's foreign ministry. During the seven days of talks starting next Monday, the Japanese Red Cross and its North Korean counterpart are expected to discuss the repatriation of the remains of Japanese nationals abducted by North Korea. There is speculation the two sides may even talk about Pyongyang repatriating Japanese abductees believed to be still alive in the north. The last Red Cross talks between the two countries were held in Beijing back in 2012. A top U.S. defense official says Pyongyang's plan to cut the army's overall troop numbers will not affect the number of U.S. troops stationed in South Korea. Speaking at a forum in Washington this week, acting Deputy Secretary of Defense Christine Fox said the U.S. military operations in Korea will not be affected as they are crucial to ensure the security of the Korean Peninsula. She added the U.S. military rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region will also not change. Currently. There are slightly over 28,000 U.S. troops stationed here in Korea. Earlier this week, U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel unveiled plans to cut U.S. Army numbers by between 70 and 80,000. 
Former Japanese Prime Minister Tomiichi Murayama says Tokyo should scrap plans to re-examine its landmark apology for forcing women to work as sex slaves for its military during World War II. When asked about the Abe government's recent remarks on reconsidering the 1993 Kono Statement, Murayama, who had also apologized for Japan's wartime atrocities during his premiership, said reopening the case would do nothing but offend Koreans. Meanwhile, the Chinese government has decided to de designate a National Memorial Day for the victims of the 1937 Nanjing Massacre. Analysts say the move is part of China's protest campaign against Japan following Abe's visit to a controversial war shrine that honors several Class A war criminals. Back here in Korea, the National Assembly is expected to vote on 160 bills on Friday, uh, the last day of this month's extraordinary session. The list of bills on the table include one that would allow Parliament to swiftly appoint special prosecutors for investigations into sensitive issues. However, it is unclear whether bills related to people's livelihoods will gain approval before the session ends because of differences among the rival parties. The parties are particularly divided over a pension a uh, bill that would offer a monthly pension to senior citizens over the age of 65 in the bottom 70% of the income bracket. Korea's household debt recently surpassed 1 quadrillion won. That's roughly 930 billion U.S. dollars. And Yes, <laughs> and to tackle the uh, very heavy debt, the government has announced policy measures to get borrowers and lenders to bring down their debt faster. Ji Myung Gil reports. The government announced on Thursday a set of measures for tackling the country's chronic household debt problem, with Finance Minister Han Ozok saying the government will be proactive. To bring the ballooning amount of household debt under control, the government has set a goal of lowering the debt-to-income ratio by five percentage points by the end of 2017. The debt-to-income ratio stood at 164 percent as of the end of 2012. The government said the debt-to-income ratio was near the mid-160 percent range at the end of last year. Economists view household debt as a persistent problem for the economy as it could affect domestic demand. To address it, Korea's financial regulator urged local banks to raise the portion of fixed-rate loans. The Financial Services Commission plans to push local banks to increase the portion of loans with fixed interest rates and encourage households to repay the principal and interest together. The regulator hopes to raise the portion of both fixed rate loans and principal interest repayments to 40 percent by the end of 2017. Financial regulators also said the growth in the amount of debt held by self-employed people or people using secondary financial institutions such as savings banks say it's a bad sign, as people in this group tend to have higher rates of defaulting on their debt. Tim young Arirang News. Industrial output in Korea's mining and manufacturing industries continued to expand in January, marking the fourth straight month of gains. But last month's 0.1 percent growth has declined sharply from the previous month, largely because there were fewer workdays due to the Lunar New Year holiday. Statistics Korea says the growth of overall industrial output inched up to the 1 percent range in January, suggesting the domestic economy may be recovering. Spending jumped to a 34-month high of 2.4 percent due to an increase in sales of food and automobiles during the New Year holiday. Koreans are increasingly opting to vacation overseas rather than right here in Korea. But there is plenty to see and enjoy within Korea's borders. And the government is determined to remind them and everyone else of this fact. Our Connie Kim reports. Take a sneak peek at Korea's best travel destinations. Ahead of an 11-day travel week designated by the government in May, the Culture Ministry and Korea Tourism Association have launched a travel exhibition to give Koreans a better idea of where to spend their vacations. The exhibition kicked off with Korean fusion music with the Culture Minister, foreign ambassadors and Seoulites in attendance. 
There are a lot of good travel destinations in Korea. We want to inform and promote diverse places so that people can visit different places in the nation. Uh, for me, as the ambassador of Russia, it's of uh, great importance, especially this year, because uh, our two presidents last November, when my president, Mr. Putin, he visited Korea, they reached an agreement uh, on the uh, uh, special uh, regime for uh, visits. So uh, I am waiting for crowds of Russian tourists coming to Korea. From the city of Andong's famous Korean beef to Ulundo Island's pumpkin taffy, the exhibition introduces a unique taste that different regions of the country offer. Visitors were drawn in by the exhibition's national park booth, where they got to walk on simulated park trails. One feature that highlights the ecology of the demilitarized zone was especially popular, offering visitors a chance to see something they normally can't. While there's plenty to do for adults, there's just as much for children to take in and enjoy. Archery was the most fun activity, and I learned that Gangwon-do has great scenery and lots to do. I want to visit Gangwon-do. With plans to encourage Koreans to travel more within the country, the nation's one and only travel exhibition will be welcoming visitors until March 2nd at the COEX Convention Center. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Hello everyone, this is Kwon Suwa with the latest news around the world. Turning to the latest in crisis hit Ukraine, where armed men have seized the regional parliament in a mainly ethnic Russian region. The United States is urging Russia to show in the coming days that it's sincere about its promise not to intervene in Ukraine. Shin Se-min has the details. In Ukraine, what started a small crack as fast turning into a crevice after armed men seized a Crimean regional government headquarters Thursday and raised a Russian flag. Ukraine's new rulers in Kiev have warned that any movement by Russian forces beyond the base's territory would be tantamount to aggression. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov moved to assure U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry that Russia will respect Ukraine's territory. In response, the U.S. told Russia to show it's sincere about its promise. Washington is concerned after Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a surprise military exercise on Ukraine's doorstep this week. Other Western nations like Britain and Germany are also calling on Russia to help ease the turmoil in Ukraine's Russian-dominated region. Also Thursday, the new Ukrainian government held its first cabinet meeting, led by newly appointed Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk. In the meantime, ouster President Viktor Yanukovych is said to be in Russia, as Russian state news agencies reported he plans to hold a news conference on Friday. He has declared he is still Ukraine's president, but has lost support across almost the entire country. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Let's take a look at further stories. Britain's intelligence agency has reportedly captured still webcam images of millions of Yahoo users, which include a large quantity of sexually explicit images. The Guardian newspaper reported on Thursday that GDHQ, with the help of the U.S. National Security Agency, gathered materials based on documents originating from NSA leaker Edward Snowden. A program called Optic Nerve made the interceptions possible and stored captures between 2008 and 2010. Yahoo said if the report is true, it would be a whole new level of violation of their users' privacy. In a bid to reunify the long-divided island Cyprus, Turkish and Greek negotiators made simultaneous exchange visits to Athens and Ankara on Thursday. The high-level peace negotiations are the first in almost two years. No press were allowed in the meeting, but a Turkish newspaper quotes an official as saying the talks were a positive start. Cyprus was divided in 1974 with the Greek Cypriot South and the Turkish Cypriot North, when Turkey sent in military forces following a Greek-inspired coup which sought to unite the island with Greece. 
U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen says harsh weather such as heavy snow and cold snaps played a role in the lower than forecast figures in the employment, retailing and manufacturing sectors. Yellen told a key Senate committee on Thursday that Fed officials will look into the matter as they are not sure how big the weather factor is and whether it will influence the tapering of the Fed's bond buying program. If plans stay on course, the Fed will trim its monthly bond purchases from 65 to 55 billion U.S. dollars next month. A Japanese rocket carrying a precipitation tracking satellite successfully blasted into orbit early Friday. The so-called Global Precipitation Measurement Satellite is the first of five Earth science launches NASA has planned for this year and is a joint project with Japan's space agency JAXA. NASA says the 900 million US dollar GPM satellite is the most exact instrument for measuring rain and snowfall, meaning it could mark the beginning of better tracking of storm forecasts to predict floods, landslides and hurricanes. U.S.'s Arizona Governor Jen Brewer has vetoed a controversial bill that would have allowed businesses to refuse, uh, refuse service to gay and lesbian customers. Brewer, a Republican, said the law could result in unintended and negative consequences such as hurting the state's economy by driving away businesses. The state capital of Arizona, Phoenix, is the host city for next year's Super Bowl and the bill raised concerns the event, which is likely to bring in hundreds of millions of dollars to the local economy, could be moved. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. A three-parent in vitro fertilization technique is stirring up controversy in the United States. Yes, while biologists say the procedure is a promising way to stop inherited diseases, critics claim it will lead to a generation of designer babies. Kim Minji reports. Baby monkey Mido has three parents, two biological mothers and one father. Mido's mother's egg was injected with mitochondrial DNA from a female donor and then fertilized with this father's sperm. Mitochondria are energy-producing structures which biologists call the powerhouses that drive the cells. Although the material makes up less than 1% of a person's genes, a mutation can cause various inherited diseases, such as Alzheimer's, diabetes, and even cancer. The researchers who had success with the three-parent in vitro fertilization technique with Mido said the procedure should be allowed for humans. This will work in humans because uh, we've tested it in, in other primates, non-human primates. However, the procedure has sparked controversy among critics. They say it is unethical and leads to a generation of customized designer babies. If it is our opinion right now that we can correct the children this way, um, that means that we become the uh, manufacturers of new generations. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration held public hearings this week on whether to allow human trials, but no decisions were made. Meanwhile, Britain on Thursday proposed new rules allowing scientists to create three-parent embryos to prevent the passage of incurable diseases to children. If the rules are approved, Britain will become the first country in the world to allow three-parent in vitro fertilization. Kim min Arirang News. Now, very exciting times here at Arirang TV because it's been a week since uh, we were... We are, of course, Korea's only global broadcasting network, but we've found a new home in the United States. And in case you didn't already know, Arirang TV is now available on America's number one satellite television provider, Direct TV, and we are on channel number 2095. And we now go live to our Hwang Jie in Los Angeles to see how people in Southern California are enjoying their new channel so far. Hello there, Jie. Guys, it's been an exciting week for Arirang TV as people not only here in Los Angeles but also across the United States now are now having an easier access to the programs of Arirang TV. In fact, I'm currently in the house of an avid Arirang viewer. This is 
Choi Jung-in, thanks for letting us in, Jung-in. So how is it like to have Arirang on Direct TV? Well, we've been watching Arirang TV here at my home, and I think it's really great to have a new source of um, Korean culture for my family. All right, thank you for speaking to us. But viewers can also watch programs of Arirang TV at hotels, at airports, and at hospitals, giving Arirang an even greater reach. Here at this hotel in southern Los Angeles, Arirang TV on Direct TV is available free of charge to guests. Uh, we used to not have uh, the Arirang TV on Direct TV like before, but since we are located in Wilshire and Western, it's in the middle of Korea town, it's good to have Arirang TV for the, uh, the guests. Starting last Thursday, Direct TV customers in the United States could find Arirang TV in their channel lineup on channel number 2095, as the Korean broadcasting station has been added to Direct TV's programming as a public interest channel. Direct TV, based in Southern California, is America's number one satellite television provider that competes with cable TV. K-pop lovers Riley and Allison, who are huge fans of Arirang TV's after-school club program, say they're delighted to have Arirang TV on Direct TV. It's really convenient. We can just turn on the channel and our, the K-pop shows are already there. We don't have to like search for it on the internet anymore. We can just watch it on TV, so it's a lot easier. Arirang CEO Song Jie says she's confident that the Korean broadcasting station will be able to raise the awareness of Korea and the Korean culture in the United States. Guys? Well, it really is fabulous news that all these extra people in America can now enjoy all the wonderful programs we offer here at Arirang TV. Well, thanks, Jihae. That was our Hwang Jie reporting on Arirang TV's inclusion on America's number one satellite television provider, DirecTV. Good Friday afternoon. Well, today will be slightly cooler than yesterday with highs in the low teens, but still a little above average for the season. And as you may have noticed, the air got much cleaner than it's been this week. Dust levels have finally returned to normal, so the whole nation can breathe a bit easier today. But it will not be as sunny as it has been the last couple of days because we have cloud covering over the peninsula all day. Day long. Now, tomorrow, the southern provinces can expect rain sometime between tomorrow morning and the late afternoon, but the upper parts of the nation will have mild weather with no rain in the forecast. Now, I just wanted to let you know that due to the relatively warmer temperatures we've been having, spring flowers are expected to bloom earlier than usual this year, and I'll be sure to have more details on that another day. But here are the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul and Busan will get up to 12, and Taegu and Gwangju will top out at 11 and 14 respectively. Now, let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will climb up to 11, and Jeju will rise to 13, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at minus 2. Now, that's all for me this week, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. And that's all for now, but today is a 
a special but also quite sad day because <laughs> we have to bid farewell to you, Sam, because she's leaving her anchoring duties to be our next presidential correspondent. Uh, don't have to say congratulations. She deserves it a great deal. <laughs> Thank you. And from myself and the weather girl, Gian, and behalf of everyone on the Arirang News team, thanks ever so much for your hard work over the past 12 months, getting up every day, on time, every day, <laughs> working so hard. We really appreciate it, and best of luck at Chongwa Day. Uh, we're going to look forward very much to seeing your reports over the next two years to come. Thank you, Mark. Mark, you've been a truly a wonderful co-host and a real good friend. And I also want to thank our production team for their commitment to our new show. And not last but not least, to our viewers for tuning into our show every weekday. And I look forward to working with everyone uh, in the near future. And that does it for this Friday edition of Newsline at Noon. Thank you very much.